Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Digging Deeper Moment number 55. The mission of our Digging Deeper Moments is to take God's Word to God's world. We are so glad that you joined us. Two weeks ago, in moment number 53, we began looking at what the Bible has to say about the subject of predestination. We commenced our study by looking at Romans 8.28, which tells us that everything in life, good and bad, works for good, isn't good, but works for good for those who respond to God's call to live out His purposes for their lives. Last week, in moment number 54, we looked at Romans 8.29 and saw that God has predestined those whom He foreknew would respond to the gospel to be conformed to the image of Christ through the suffering this world brings to us. We've also seen that the context of Romans 28, 28, and 29 is how God uses suffering to fulfill His purpose, which is for us to be conformed into the image of Christ so that we can be part of God's family. Therefore, the predestination spoken of here is not speaking of double predestination, which is the belief that God elects some to be saved and works through the Holy Spirit to bring them to Christ, and that God does not elect others and therefore does not work on their behalf to bring them to Christ. So if the Bible speaks of double predestination, we'll have to find it in other scriptures. If you missed these two Digging Deeper moments, I recommend that you view them first before viewing this one. You'll find them on our website at www.eaglesnest.ch. Just go to, this, go to the website and hit the Sermons tab and click Digging Deeper. Tonight we'll be continuing our study by looking at Romans 8, 30, verse 30 through 39. In Romans 8, 30, the Apostle Paul writes, Moreover, he, or moreover, whom he, God, predestined, that is, those God has foreknown, would respond to the gospel and are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, these he also called or invited through the gospel, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. The word moreover is a Greek conjunction, which means but, now, or but also. The Apostle Paul is saying basically this. But let me tell you a couple more things while I'm at it. First, whom God predestined, that is those God foreknew who would respond to the gospel, and those He predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ through suffering, were not only called, not only invited through the gospel, they were also justified. Up to this point in verse 30, Paul was basically repeating himself, but now he adds something new to the equation, justification. Simply put, justification means to be put right with God, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul then goes on to say that those foreknown, predestined, called, and justified have also been glorified. What Paul means here by glorified is a little confusing because it is in the aorist tense, which is a past tense, which means God has already glorified them. And so what he's basically saying, he's already glorified them. Well, when I look around at people and and I look as particularly those I see every day, I don't see a lot of glorified people except maybe my wife. Like most men, I've said to my wife on occasion, you look radiant tonight. Now, when we say that we, somebody looks radiant, what we're really saying is they're kind of glowing, and, but that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying that they're glowing. That's, that's not what he means here. And so it's a little bit confusing. So I took some time to look this up. According to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which provides a very long history of how this word for glory is used throughout history, they summarize its meaning, and I quote, "...the word is also used strictly in the New Testament to express the divine mode of being." This is true of all New Testament authors. This is a great definition. Now, if you were to go to their dictionary, it's quite thick with a lot of information, but they boil it down to this simple phrase. It's the divine mode of being. It's basically as Saint Irenaeus put it back in the second century when he said that God, that the glory of God is a man fully alive. In other words, man's purpose is to represent God in the earth. And what Paul is telling us here in this verse is he's saying that those God foreknew would respond to the gospel, those He predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ, those He called to the gospel, and those that responded to the call are justified. They're put right with God. They have been justified. So when you receive Christ, you've been justified. You've been freed of all sin, forgiven of all sin. 
and have been restored. When he's talking about the glory, he says they've been restored to God's original purpose, their divine mode of being. And so the question is, what is the divine mode of being for humanity? Well, it's to represent God on the earth. This is why Paul connects the idea of predestination to being conformed to the image of Christ with the purpose of God and how He uses suffering to shape us into the image of Christ. Because as we're shaped into the image of Christ, we are glorified. We are brought back to represent God. We are back, we're brought back into the divine mode of being for humanity, which is to represent God on the earth. That takes us right back to the book of Genesis when God said He made man in His image and His likeness. You and I are brought back into that image and likeness through the gospel, and we are glorified in being brought back through the gospel into representing God once again on the earth. Boy, that is just filled with all kinds of thoughts and meaning. But when it comes to suffering, we see that the context of this is the suffering, that God uses our suffering to shape Christ's image into us so we can represent Him on the earth. And that is just how Jesus lived. You know, when we look at Hebrews chapter 2.10, we find that Jesus was made complete. The word in the, is used in the Bible is perfect, but it means complete. He was completed in His humanity and His call to represent God through suffering, according to Hebrews 2.10. Now, as of yet, Paul has said nothing about God's work in the lives of the unbelievers. And that's why we keep saying that right now we've not, we're not talking about double predestination. Right now, we're only talking about the work of God in the life of the believer. And so everything Paul writes here is about what God does in the life of the believer. And the context is through suffering. And earlier it was what the Holy Spirit does in us in chapter 8, verses like 23, 24, 25, 26. But as we move on in the context, I want you to notice in verses 31 through 39, he returns to the subject of suffering. He returns to the context. He returns to the theme of the chapter that we've been studying, Romans 8, basically 17 through the end of chapter 8. The context is suffering. And the rhetorical questions in the sense that a rhetorical question is not really asked for you to answer it. It's asked to get you to think about something. The answer is usually obvious in a rhetorical question. So we pick it up in verse 31 with the first one. After says he justified these, he also glorified. In verse 31 he says, What then, question number one, shall we say to these things? In other words, what does all this mean? What do we learn from this? Okay, which leads to a second question. If God is for us, who can be against us? What we learn from this is in Romans 8, 28 through 30, is that even the things that are against us in life, just by the nature of suffering and the struggling of life, it does not mean that God is against us. In fact, he's saying God isn't against us, even though things are against us, and God will use the things that come against us to bring about His purpose in our lives, which is to look like Christ in His character and to represent Him on the earth. These verses don't say God is against anyone. They don't say who God is against or if He's against anyone. He's not talking about what happens to the unbeliever or the lost. We'll get into that next week when we start again in chapter 9. These verses tell us that God is for us. He is for those who He foreknew. He is for those that He called. He's, he's for those that received the gospel. He's for those that He's predestined. He's for those that He justified. And He's for those whom He's restored to the original purpose that God has for our lives, which is to represent Jesus. In fact, the main point of this entire section of Romans is not predestination. That's the thing we've got to get here. The main subject is not predestination. It is a subject talked about. But it's not the main subject. The main subject is how God uses suffering in the life of a believer to shape their character into the image of Christ so that they can fulfill their calling to represent God in the earth. It is God foreknew us. He knew we would respond. And now He's using the things in our lives to fulfill the purpose to make us like Christ, which then leads to another question. He goes on to say, He who did not spare His Son but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? 
In other words, God's not against us. God's given us everything. He's given us Jesus Christ. He's not against us. Who shall bring, he goes on to say in question number four, who shall bring anything, a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now, that's not a question in the Greek, and that's why there's no question mark. But basically, it is is italicized in your Bible, which means it's not in the Greek. It says God who justifies. That You could put a question mark on that, even though there's not one in the Greek, to my knowledge. But the idea of what Paul's doing is doing rhetorical questions. He's saying, hey, guys, even though everything comes against us in the world, it doesn't mean God is, is against us. And he's asking a series of questions to get people to think about what he's saying. He's saying, hey, guys... Is You think God's against us when He sent us His only begotten Son, that He died on the cross for us, that He's given us all things? He says, of course not. And He goes on to say, he, who is He who condemns? In other words, who's going to condemn us? That's question number five. Is it Christ who died? The answer is, of course not. And furthermore, has also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? He's saying, is God going to be the one that condemns you? Though Jesus died for you and now stands on the, sits at the right hand of God and is making intercession for you, he's saying, obviously not. God is for us. That's the message here. God is for you. He's for me when we respond to the gospel. Now, we'll talk about when people don't next week or in the next couple weeks. He goes on to ask a sixth question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He's returning to his theme here, the suffering of the believer. And watch what he does. He quotes Scripture. He says, as it is written, he quotes the Old Testament, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep of the slaughter. Paul then concludes with words of triumph and hope. But notice what he's done here. He's telling us when things are going against us and life are being persecuted for Christ's sake, God will use that to fulfill His purpose in our lives, which is to represent Him on the earth. And then after asking these series of questions to get the people that are reading for the first time and us to consider the fact that God's not against us, he concludes with this in verse 37. He says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow! The entire point of Romans 28 through 39 is to tell us that suffering is not an indication that God is against us, that problems in our lives are not an indication that God is working against us. On the contrary, God is for us, for those who are foreknown and have responded to His call, who are predestined according to His purpose to be shaped into the image of Christ. He's even using these things that are against us to fulfill that purpose. And so as of yet, we have not come upon the subject of double predestination. However, we do see what we do see is that Paul uses the word elect for the first time in verse 33 when he says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And the idea of the elect is a big central theme in the idea of double predestination. And so that is where we're going to pick it up next week as we move into chapter 9 and we begin to move into what Paul has to say about the elect and what that has to say about double predestination. You won't want to miss it. We're going to get into some really neat things in the next couple weeks. I hope that you'll join us. If this lesson has been helpful, please pass it on to a friend. I hope to see you. Bye-bye.